I use all my stuff all the time. So, all right, here we go. Okay, we start by stating the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. Uh, <clears throat> we've done part two. Today we're going to do part one. I think that uh, part two is easier to understand because it directly relates to uh, the area and coming up with that finite number which we did. Uh, so we start by stating part two. Uh, if f is continuous on AB, so there's no points where it's discontinuous, there's no points where it's undefined over that domain, it's continuous the entire way, then The integral from a to b of f of x dx is equal to, you tell me, don't do it the hard way, do it the easy way, f of b minus f of a, where f is what? Good, is an antiderivative? Of F. We understand what that means. That's what we were doing when we were finding the area of all those rectangles and adding them up. We understood that you take the antiderivative in order to come up with that uh, this piece right here. But what is part one state? Part one is very important. It always gets lost in the shuffle. Part two is what everybody focuses on. But the first part is um, is pretty neat. It's much more complex to understand. So we, we really, you, you got to focus if you have questions, you got to ask. Otherwise, we're not going to get this, okay? Uh, if F is continuous on AB, Then G is defined by, let's write that, G of X equals the integral from A to X of f of t dt, where a is between x and b, and I'll save the last part for the end because it's probably the most important. Okay. <laughs> here you go. What do you notice about this piece right here? What looks maybe strange? Okay. The, never mind the T. The T you will understand when we just, for all you care about, the T could just be an X. All right? The T could be an X. Okay? That... <laughs> The point is, is that later on when we do a substitution piece and a chain rule piece, uh, we're going to be glad that that's T, all right? Look at this, okay? Normally, we're used to having A here and what up here? B. So here's the difference, okay? This does not define an ending point, okay? As B gets bigger, what do you think happens to the function overall? It gets bigger, okay? As this changes, this changes. Okay. What do you think the relationship is between F and G? Okay. Look at right here. What do you think the relationship is between F and F? What do you do to what do you do to little F to get big F? 
Antiderivative. What do you think you do to F to get G? Antiderivative. So the antiderivative or area function, okay, can be written like this. So if I were to take the derivative of the area function, what do you think I would get? F of X. So the crucial part that you guys are learning today is that we are talking about inverse operations, okay? If you take the derivative of g of x, what's the derivative of g of x? g prime of x. Now, when you take the derivative of the right-hand side, this integral stuff just goes away and you're left with the function. So integrals and derivatives are inverse operations of each other, okay? Just like taking one-half times two, that's inverse operation multiplication, okay? So we'll show that for you in a little bit. Let's look at the graphical representation of the fundamental theorem of calculus part one so we can understand maybe a little bit better. I like this drawing. We'll see if it works for you, okay? Again, we have a function. We will bound it from A to B. We'll call that function f of t. And we'll have some value x that resides between a and b. So all I'm going to do is take what I have up here and I'm going to put it down here. Okay. Look at what it says. x resides between a and b. I have that on here, don't I? I have my function. F is continuous right here. Okay? That's my function. All right? If you see this integral symbol from A to X of F of T DT, that makes you think that you're taking the area, right? So that's what we're going to draw. This is referring to the area from A to X. So this is the g of x equals the integral that's this piece so again as we slide x to the right what's going to happen to g of x as we slide x to the left, what's going to happen to g of x? In this function, it would. We could draw other functions where that would not be the case. But let's state the relationship in a little bit different way. The rate of change of the area function What is the area function? g of x. So the rate of change of the area function is g prime of x. So the rate of change of the area function, g prime of x, is equal to f of x. Whatever the function value is at that spot. If you take the derivative of the area function, so the rate at which the area function is changing, you get the original function up on top. That's the relationship. It's not normal to see this once and be like, oh, yeah, I get it all. It's right there. You, you really got to work through it. You got to chew on it for a while, okay? So let's uh, try an example, okay? If we could get through ex this uh, first example right here, um, I'll be really, really, really happy, okay? So... Let's give it a shot. It says, concrete example right here. Let's put it to use. G of X is equal to the integral from negative 6 to X of F of T dt. Evaluate uh, negative 6, G of negative 4, G of negative 2, G of 0, 2, 4, and 6. Okay? If you see this, there is one word that should come to mind for you, and it starts with an A. Antiderivative or area. Either one. Okay? We'll start with A. You see an integral symbol, you should think, oh, I take the antiderivative. 
Uh, since we don't actually have something we know we can take the antiderivative of, we think, okay, maybe we can express it as area. And in this case, we can. Let's count back negative 6, okay? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. <clears throat> this line right here is going to be represented by f of t. That's my function. So, let's draw the bounds from negative 6 right here to an x value of negative 6, okay? If I, if I bound from negative 6 to negative 6, what's the area from negative 6 to negative 6? Yeah, the width is what? The width is 0, so the area is 0. Now... Let's bound it to negative 4. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4 back. Okay. G of negative 4, I'm just putting a negative 4 in for the x right there. So I'm finding the area bounded between the x-axis and f of t from negative 6 to negative 4. What is that area? 2. See? We counted the squares. Okay, now let's do uh, negative 3. Okay? Or, I'm sorry, negative 2 it says. I go over to negative 2. Oh, boy. So this is going to look a little bit trickier. I'm going to draw the red because it's under the x-axis. What do you notice? The, the stuff below the x-axis is negative. That cancels out with that part right there. So what are you left with? Yep, I am sure. Three. Okay, now we're going to do g of 0. All right. Let, let's just look really quick, though, you guys. Shh. Look. Are the values getting bigger or smaller? They're getting bigger. Watch what happens here. Okay. Now, if I go all the way to 0, um, the current value is 3, but now i got to do what? Subtract off 3. So if I box these in, I'm, I'm down to how much? zero and then if I box this one and I'm down to negative one and then about what is this one and that one yeah negative two or I'm sorry if you put this one on that one it would be a negative one so you have negative three we had zero we had negative we had positive three then we had a negative three to make zero and we had negative 1 to make negative 1, and another negative 1 to make negative 2. Now what's happening to the, to the function? What's happening to this function now? It's decreasing, isn't it? It's going down. Yeah, as soon as we, so this point would be the, not the inflection, it would be the maximum, yeah. Because it, it got to its biggest value right there. Exactly. So we're going to talk about that. Does it have a minimum value? Does it have a maximum value? Very good. We'll talk about that. Okay, let's do g of 2. We go over to 2. Oh, we're still negative, aren't we? How much more negative do I add on to that? Negative 6 more, which brings me to negative 8. Uh, g of 4. Oh, I'm going to add on some more negative. This would be negative 9. Looks like uh, looks like this one and this one cancel out, don't they? They look pretty close to canceling out. So we're still at negative 9. And then uh, approximately, if you put this one and this one together, that's about another negative 1. So we're at about what? Negative 10. 
So our function is still what? It's still decreasing. And then finally we do g of 6. We got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So let's color in some more boxes here. So I'm at negative 10 and I'm going to go up 3. So that's 13. I, I'm sorry, that's negative 7. I color in this one, I'm at negative 6. Color in, say, this one and that one, I'm at negative five, and then this one I'm at about, say, negative four and a half, maybe? Sure. Somewhere around there. Okay. So, we just defined function values, okay? We just defined function values for g of x. Now the question is, on what intervals is g of x increasing? Where is it increasing? If we start at negative six, we saw it increased. It increased to what point? Negative two and and a half, right? Right there is where it stopped increasing. You can see the area went from positive to negative. So it increased to that spot. So from negative six to negative two and a half. Okay, what happened after that? It started decreasing, right? It decreased from negative two and a half to what? It kept on decreasing until well three and a half. What happened after that? It started increasing again from three point five, and they don't tell us where we should stop, so we'll just say we stopped at six. Okay. So does it have a minimum value? Yeah, minimums happen where you go from decreasing to increasing. And we went from uh, decreasing to increasing right at what point? 3.5. It says sketch a rough graph of g of x. So I know it's like, well... Okay, we know what f of t looked like. That was the, the black line that ran through there. I'll copy over it one more time. I'll draw the other one in green, but you know, can we draw g of x in green? Well, sure we can. Uh, we can't draw an exact graph right now. We maybe don't have time to do that, but we can draw a rough graph. And all we're going to do is we're just going to plot the points. If you plug in negative 6, you get 0. So, you know, negative 6, 0. You get 4 positive 2. Negative 2, positive 3, 0, negative 2, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. As you look at the graph of f of x, do you think that this graph of g of x, do you think it's going to be have curves to it, or do you think it's going to have uh, straight lines? It is going to have straight lines, and we don't have time to talk about exactly the... <laughs> well, you, you can see that, uh, you know, the area increases at a constant rate right here. It increases at a rate of 1. So, I... I, I'm not going to, you know, we're not going to spend all this time, you know. I, it, it's going to look something like that, okay? Something like that. Okay. So what do you think? Okay. Is, that, is that okay? Not too bad? If you could do that, you're golden. Could you do an example like this? If you went back and looked back at it? Okay, if you can do that, the, the rest is easy. All right, here we go. See if we can do it. 
Use the fundamental theorem of calculus part one in order to find the derivative of the following functions. So, what is the derivative of g of x? It is g prime of x. So I take the derivative of the left hand side, I get g prime. Now, derivatives, again, are inverse operations of integrals. So this sign, prime, okay, like f prime, is an inverse operation to integral of f. So if you're going to take the derivative of this, what goes away is your integral sign and your dt sign. That stuff goes away. Yeah, and you put the x in there. So root of x plus 3. That's it. We'll have some examples like this on the test. That's it. So if we take g prime of x, what do you think you get? Very good. 3x squared secant of x. But just... Okay. Because so, <laughs> we're going to get to it. So... I want you guys to understand something. If on the AP Calculus exam, if they ask this question, you know, you can see that if you didn't know the relationship, that would look like a very complicated problem, wouldn't it? So, the, the <laughs> a lot of the questions, you just got to recognize the relationship. Okay? So. All right, natural log of T. Natural log of T. All right. So, shh. What's different about these two? What's different about these two? X is on the bottom. Here's the deal. Okay. Shh. Shh. If you switch the bounds, okay, I'll write this down once and you'll see it, okay? If you switch the bounds, if we took that's equal to If we took A and B and we switched them, they're identical, except by a factor of negative 1. Okay? So, have you noticed that on your calculator when you punch in uh, the lower limit and the upper limit? Sometimes you do it incorrectly. Like instead of going, you know, 1 to 3, you type in 3 to 1, and you get the negative sign. Raise your hand if you've done that, okay? there's There's been a few people, okay? I've had at least three questions on it. So that's what happens. So, if I see the bound switched immediately, I write this. G prime of x is equal to, and I put a negative sign. Because I know that the bound switching creates a negative. And then, what is the derivative of this? Sine of x squared. Very good. Uh, this is kind of tricky, okay? Do you guys know what the derivative of natural log of t is? You don't know what it is. Can we still do the problem? Yeah. All right. You don't have to know the derivative of it. We'll learn it later. Actually, do you know what the derivative of natural log of x is? 1 over x. Close. <laughs> Lindsay, hold up one figure. It's 1. <laughs> Good guess. <laughs> okay. Now we will uh, change things up a little bit. Okay. Now you'll see why we put the T in there. Okay. What's different about this? Yeah. Look at look at what you got. Okay. Look at what's happening, people. You've got, you're going to take the derivative with respect to what variable? Derivative with respect to x, okay? And when you take the derivative with respect to x, you have change happening here, and then this gets substituted into there. When you have, shh, when you have a function in a function, what rule do we use? 
Chain rule. Chain rule. So, what would we normally substitute in when we took the derivative? We would substitute in the 2x to the third, right? So that's what goes here. And the outside structure is going to be what we would plug it into, or t over t squared minus 1. Whoop, I'm sorry. That's, that's our structure. All right. What's the derivative of this? T over T squared minus 1. What's the derivative of this? And remember, for the chain rule, we need to plug it back in. So right now we have the variable t. What are we used to seeing with the chain rule? What variable do we use? u. And so instead of a u, we have a t. That's why you see the t and the x to prepare us for situations like this, OK? Yep. Yep, t is, is like u Yep, in this situation. So I take the 2x to the third, and I plug it in there. Remember, i got to multiply the 2 together. So the derivative of g of x, so g prime of x, is going to be uh, 2x to the third over 2x to the third squared minus 1 times 6x squared over 1. So g prime of x, yep, as Larry said, let's put it together and we get 12x5. It's horrible. Four x is six minus one. And just for good measure, make sure it sinks in. We'll we'll do another one where you gotta use a chain rule. And again, the idea that we use a chain rule is that you have a function that you're substituting in. So you got rate of change with respect to another uh, function. All right. What? Let's just do this. If you don't like this on the bottom, then just do this right away. G of x is also equal to the integral from 2 to 1 minus 4x, and we change it from negative to positive. Cube root of sine of t. Yep. So... If we change the bounds, then we just have to, you know, change it by a factor of negative 1. That's all you have to do. If you switch the bounds, change it by a factor of negative 1. That's what we did. So you would rather deal with that now, wouldn't you? So uh, let's set up our structure. What's the thing that we're going to substitute in? The minus 4x is what we're going to substitute in. Okay. I'm sorry I said that. I'm not sure if you guys re remember. We substituted the x in up here for the t. So I, that's why I said, what are we substituting back in? We're, we would want to substitute that top piece in, that 1 minus 4x. Okay? And then the outer structure of the problem uh, with another variable is going to be the integral from 2 to t. So 1 minus 4x is t. We got cubed root of sine of t. We have a dt. So we set up the chain rule. What is the derivative of the integral from 2 to t of cubed root of sine t dt? Cubed root of sine of t. Very good. So I'm going to put this in there for the t. What is the derivative of 1 minus 4x? Negative 4. 
So now all I need to do is multiply the two together. So what we have is g prime of x is equal to, go ahead, you said. Thank you. So that's it. You may have to use a chain rule in some of those scenarios. What, what do you think? Not too bad. So this is the last piece. Your study guide is six pages in length. Um, you're going to have time tomorrow to work on uh, homework and ask questions. Wednesday is definitely the study guide. Thursday is your test. Here's your assignment. So my guess is you guys have some worksheets that you still need to finish off. You've got some homework you've been uh, kind of a little bit lazy with. Time to get on top of it.